I am inside of a Jupyter Notebook with a relatively standard setup. I have a pipeline object over here that contains a few estimators. And this pipeline is inserted over here into this grid search where I can do some hyperparameter tuning. You can see a nice visual of the grid below here where indeed we can see both of these estimators being listed. Now, the thing I wanna zoom in on in this video is this setting over here, this cross validation equals to five bit. When you just pass in a integer over here, you basically get to determine how many times the data set is split up into train and test sets to come up with a metric. Now in the base setting, if this were your entire data set, you would split it up into five segments, something like this. And the thinking would be that the first time around, this part of your data set would belong to the test set and then everything inside of here we would be part of the train set. And the second time around, this would be the test set and everything else would be the train set, et cetera. This would be the standard way you do cross-validation. But in this particular case, that's actually not what is happening here. And there's a bit of subtlety involved, which I would like to explain in this video. So let's do a bit of a whiteboarding session and let's draw out how you might be able to split a data set. And we're gonna go with five segments for now. Now let's say that this is your data set. In the base setting, you could say that this is maybe your first test set and everything else would be the train set. And you could do that for all of these separate bins. The idea here feels simple enough, but let's discuss a little bit of nuance right off the bat. You see, when you're dealing with cross-validation, a big data set like this typically contains your X variable, which is everything that you're using to make the prediction, as well as your label. Both are part of this cross-validation split, you could say. And here comes a bit of a consequence if you're not careful. Let's pretend now that we're dealing with a classification task. And let's also go for a rather extreme example. Let's pretend that all the classes that we have on top over here, let's pretend that those are all positive classes. And let's pretend that everything else here has a negative class associated. I'm uh, pretending that I'm dealing with a binary classification use case here. Well, then I could definitely split up my data. That could kind of still work. But hopefully when I draw it this way, you also become aware that there actually can be a problem if the distribution of these labels are just a little bit unfortunate. And the extreme example that I'm thinking of is a situation where there's just one split that we might have where all your positive labels are in one cross-validation split and in none of the other ones. Because what would happen here? Well, it's a bit of a theoretical situation, but if I think about the train set that I would have, I've got my X train as well as my Y train, but any algorithm that I would train here, well, it would only have the red class. This would cause all sorts of errors because scikit-learn doesn't allow for classification algorithms to only have one class label that's attached. But hopefully you can also imagine that even if that wasn't an issue, you would also get some numeric tomfoolery with regards to statistical power. After all, if you're going to be calculating metrics afterwards, it will be kind of strange if the metrics on one test set is just totally different from all the other test sets. Put differently, it certainly does feel that it would be statistically more stable if the distribution of the label across all of these different test sets was relatively the same. If there's large imbalances, that's probably gonna give us a headache down the line. So how's about this? Before that we're gonna associate these different subsets, we are gonna just shuffle things around a little bit. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that when we sample, we sample in such a way that the distribution of our label is relatively similar across all of these different subsets. This way, if we were ever to look at one of these test sets individually, we could claim that they are roughly drawing from the same distribution. It's not like one test group has way more positive labels than the other one. And this will, for starters, fix the problem that we had with scikit-learn training, because we will always have two classes available. But it will also change the statistical properties when we calculate metrics. And this is just a little bit of extra bit of work that we could be able to do. There's a fancy word of what I'm describing here, which is stratification. 
which is the process of sampling in such a way that all of our different subgroups have the same distribution. And inside of scikit-learn, there is a k-fold cross-validation strategy, but there's also a stratified k-fold strategy. And when you're doing classification inside of a grid search, and when you set cv is equal to 5, then it's actually under the hood going to assume that you're interested in getting a k-fold, but doing it in a stratified way, mainly to deal with this issue that I drew uh, just before. However, we're not always going to be using this stratified k-fold technique as a default. And to understand why, we kind of have to dive into the documentation a bit. And there we are. This is the grid search object on the scikit-learn docs. And I'm going to scroll down to read more about this CV input over here. And there it is. And then if I zoom in on this bit over here, there's a interesting little detail. If this variable is set to an integer or none, in which case it'll uh, go for a default, if the estimator is a classifier and Y is either binary or multivariable, then stratified k-fold sampling will be used. In all other cases, normal k-fold will be used. The main use case for this, by the way, would be to consider the regression models out there. But I hope it also makes sense that for regression, stratification doesn't really make that much sense. Stratification sampling really assumes different categories, which we don't have in regression land. And that's also why a different strategy can also be appropriate. In an attempt to keep things simple, what you can typically do is you can just set CV equal to 10, let's say. And this is going to give you 10 folds, either through the stratified k-fold in the case of classification or the normal k-fold in the case of regression. But instead of passing an integer, what you're also able to do is just pass a proper cross-validation splitter object. And there are good reasons to do this because there are moments when you want very tight manual control because it's very fitting to your use case. If you want to get a preview of all these different cross-validation strategies, you can actually check this user guide on the docs. This guide does a pretty good job of explaining different kinds of strategies. And typically you can find a bit of explanation together with a little bit of code with a visual at the bottom. And these visuals can be very helpful in understanding the strategy that's underlying. But before wrapping up this video on stratified cross-validation, I figured that I should also mention that it's not all necessarily a free lunch. Because let's think about the current situation. If we apply stratified sampling based on the class label, then we end up with all of these test sets, so to say, where the distribution is quite similar. And you could wonder if maybe doing this actually makes it kind of easy. After all, maybe what we're doing here is sampling in such a way that doesn't necessarily reflect reality. Just to give a example, it could be the case that there's a time component, and it could be the case that we get some positive labels uh, some of the time, but it could also very well be the case that there are days where there really just aren't any fraud labels. And who knows, maybe there's a situation where if it's a weekend, let's say, that then we suddenly get a lot more positive cases as well. If we suppose that this is what reality looks like, then hopefully you can imagine that the fact that these different sets are different, well, that kind of comes with the territory, and pretending that that's not the case can feel like statistical cheating. If in reality we see large batches where there really are no positive labels, then maybe that should be reflected in the way that we do cross-validation as well. And although there could be moments where this stratified assumption can hold, it is still an assumption that you have to be a little bit careful for. And this is particularly true if you're interested in somehow quantifying the uncertainty here. If you're interested in understanding the variance in performance across all of these different test sets, then sampling your data in such a way that all the test sets are kind of similar, that is going to make it a whole lot easier for you to get high metrics. It deserves to be said that at the time of making this recording, there's actually a pretty elaborate discussion happening on GitHub about this stratification default. If you're interested to dive more into the nitty gritty details, then check the show notes because they will have a link to the discussion that's happening over here. But the main point that I wanted to make is that stratification is a thing that is currently happening inside of scikit-learn for classification pipelines when you just use the cross-validation input to be equal to some integer.
It could be possible that this is something you're interested in, but it could also be possible that this is something that you are not interested in. And if that is the case, then I really recommend that you go with a more manual and perhaps more custom cross-validation k-folding strategy instead.